So, Viewmaster, how do you see the world? It's been an amazing journey because we have had um, each person come up and, and be prayed for for these different gifts. And you're, you're noticing now that as you've been prayed for, you begin to see things a little bit differently. And um, this happened for me uh, while Pastor Lynn was on sabbatical. The Lord convicted me. He said, you know, you've always seen yourself as an office gift of a prophet. But I see you as an office gift of a pastor. And I'm like, well, are you sure? <laughs> you know, are you, and the Lord tells you something. You're like, are you sure? And he said, yeah, you have... You have stiff-armed my gift of a pastor, office gift of a pastor, because you felt like that was Pastor Lynn's job. And you're not functioning the way you're supposed to function. You, you've seen yourself as a prophet, which has frustrated you. And I'm like, okay. Because I'd be in prayer meetings and stuff, and people would say, what is the prophet here? And I'd be like, I got nothing. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just praying for the people is all I'm doing. I don't really have any. And, and the Lord said, yeah, you have gifts of prophecy. Yeah, but it's because you're a pastor. You prophesy because you want to pastor people. All right, all right, that makes sense. So when I came into agreement with that, Pastor Lynn came back into town. And I said, I'm the pastor now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, when he came back in town, I was like, you know, the Lord told me. And he said, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. So I just wasn't seeing it. I wasn't coming into agreement with what God had already gifted me in. And I, I had seen through that lens, but I didn't come into agreement with it. So as Pastor Chuck said a few weeks ago, the greater the agreement, the greater the anointing, because you're coming into agreement. This is who God made me to be. And when you do that, something is released, especially when you're prayed over and that gift is activated. So it was always in me to be a pastor, but then now that gift is activated because I came into agreement with it. See how, I, see how that goes? So now I begin to see in a different way. So he told me, I want you to stand in the corner go stand in the corner right now. No, uh, it wasn't like that. But he said, I want you to go over there in the corner and I want you to look at the sheep during worship, during the message time. And I want you to shepherd them. I want you to see the needs in their life. I want you to call them. I want you to talk to them. I want you to check on them. And I began to see in a different, through a different lens. And it became clear. You ever, you remember the view master when you're a kid and you're like, you're going and, and you, you hit the little, little slider thing and, it, and it's between slides you know how the, the right side of that slide and the left side of this slide is, is in there in the middle and you just kind of have to jam it in and move it around and you see clearly. So that's what he's doing. He's aligning us as a body to function the way God has called each of us to function. And there's a, there's a, um, a writer that said recently that comparison is the thief of joy. So if you're in that place where you're comparing yourself to another believer, then that's going to steal your joy. So in the place where you're like, oh, man, I wish I had that gift. You know, I wish they stand up and they teach and everybody's like, oh, man, that's so good. I'm like, I want that, you know. <laughs> or somebody prophesies, they hear a word, and they're like, the Lord's saying this. And everybody's like, yes. You're like, man, mm, 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 I want that, you know. I want that gift. When in actuality, God has gifted you in a unique way. And you, what you bring is just as important as what they bring. It just looks different. So if you're, you're caught in that trap of going, oh, I'm like, not like that person. I don't look like that person. Or I don't have a spiritual walk like that guy does. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to have the spiritual walk that you're supposed to have between you and God. You're not supposed to have that guy's spiritual walk. That wouldn't make sense. He's a different dude. So ask the Lord. Who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to function in? And just do that and be comfortable with it. Because everywhere else, it's going to torment you. It's going to mess you up. So don't compare yourself to others or wish you had a different gift. Just go with the gift that, you, that God's given you and activate that and do that with all of your heart. And it's okay. That's what God's called you to do. So that's what this is coming. Um, it's, it's, it's aligning in our body. So I want to challenge you to go on our website, southbrandon.org, when you get home, not right now, um, when you get home, southbrandon.org, and then underneath the welcome tab, there's a place where you can click and you can take a spiritual gifts inventory, a survey, and you click on that survey and you can fill it out and it will tell you, kind of based on the answers to your questions, what spiritual gift that might be yours. And we're going to give you an opportunity at the end of this service to, to identify those gifts. But when I took it, I took it this week again, and um, I scored high in service, encouragement, and mercy, which I was glad that I scored high in mercy because I'm preaching the message on mercy today. Uh, so it's important that I, I have that. Um, 
So, so get online and, and do that. We, 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 our heart as pastors is for you to find out what your gift is and to do that with all your might and to be comfortable in your own skin and do what God's created you to be and just be yourself. Um, that's what God's, God's wanting. So when we talk about mercy, we talk about mercy. Um, the first thing is Jesus shows mercy. That's the first thing. Jesus shows mercy. I say shows instead of showed because I don't know if you know this, but Easter's next week and Jesus is alive. So it um, doesn't have anything to do with Easter the Sunday. Every Sunday is Easter Sunday because he's alive. He shows mercy. He shows mercy. When we go to him in prayer, he shows mercy. Jesus is never stiff arming us. He's never got his arms crossed like, all right, what do you got? Go ahead. Pray to me. Let's see if you can get my favor. No, he's not like that. He shows mercy. That's who he is. God is love. Remember that? God is love. When he's loving you and he's showing compassion, that's who he is. That He can't not love you. He can't not show you compassion. Jesus shows mercy. So what is mercy? It's defined there as a noun. Compassion shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. So if it's in your power to punish or harm someone, but you show compassion on them instead, or someone that's in need and you show compassion, that's what mercy is. It's going to that person in a time of need and showing mercy. It's amazing. So Jesus shows mercy. This great scripture, Matthew 14, 14, says, So when Jesus landed, he saw a huge crowd waiting for him. Seeing so many people, his heart was deeply moved with compassion toward them. So he nurtured them in love and cured their frailties. So this is Jesus. He's going across the sea. He's had a long day of ministry, and he gets there and sees all these people there, and he's like, you know what? Forget about it. Mic drop. You know, I'm out. I'm really tired. I'm just going to go. Let me just take a nap. A few winks. Just let me take a nap. You guys chill out till morning time. I'll be ready tomorrow. No, he sees the large crowd, and instead of going, He has compassion on them, and he goes and heals their diseases and has some compassion on them. He nurtures them in love. So Jesus shows compassion. Luke 4, 18, he's telling the people of the temple who he is. He says, the Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison doors to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Look how many mercy statements are in there. Look at that. It says, bring good news to the poor. So he's ministering to the poor to bind up the brokenhearted, those who have broken hearts. He wants to bind them up, opening the prison to those who are bound, and then comfort all who are, mo- who are mourning. There's so many mercy statements of what Jesus really stood for. And that's what God had put him on the earth to do. That's what he came to do. So, you know the expression, Lord, have mercy? If you're, from, if you're from the South, yeah, Lord, have mercy. My grandma always used to say that whenever I'd do something crazy. I'd be jumping around. I don't know if you know this, but I was kind of a hyper kid. Um, I'd jump around. She said, Lord, have mercy. Would you be still, child? Lord, have mercy. So, if you, you know, you can, you remember that, Lord, have mercy. That's where that comes from, because Jesus has mercy on us. Scripture. So, when somebody says, Lord, have mercy, it's true. He does. He has mercy. He can't help but love and show compassion to you. But not only does Jesus show mercy in that scripture about in Luke 4, 18, he talks about the spirit of God being upon him. He says that same thing about us. He says that we're going to do greater things than he did. And we're called to do all those things that we just described right there. We're called to do those things, to comfort those who are mourned. We're called to do that. We say, well, I don't have a mercy gift. Well, so what? You're still called to show mercy. We're not off the hook just because, oh, I don't have that gift. You know, that's not my gift. I don't have the service gift. I can't work in the nursery. Yeah, you can. You can do it. So, but that's the same way. The mercy, mercy gift. Just because you don't maybe not have the gift, you still, we have to give people mercy because that's the Lord, what the Lord calls us to do. So we should all show mercy to others. That's the second point. We should all show mercy to others just as Jesus did. Philippians 2 verse 1. Look at how much comfort you've found in your relationship with the anointed one. You are filled to overflowing. You like that word? Overflow. Oh, yeah. You are filled to overflowing with his comforting love. So this says, look at how much comfort you receive from your relationship with Jesus. And he says, if you're in a relationship with Jesus, you have already received comfort and grace and mercy. You've already received it. By coming to grace, you have received that mercy. 
But then it says you are overflowing with his comforting love. Does it say you may be filled to overflowing? No, it says you are. You are filled to overflowing with his compassionate love for others. Now, maybe you don't feel that. Maybe it's not there. It's not on your radar. So how we tap into that is we live life in the overflow. We show mercy to others in the overflow. We're overflowing with his love. So we need a new download of his love so that we can give that to others. We turn it around and we give mercy to others. So we should all show mercy to others. So I want to challenge you this week. Um, oh, wait, wait. I got to go to the last part of this verse. This is awesome. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit. That should have been some reaction there. Let me, let me say this again. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. We can just go home on that. If, if we are experiencing a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit. Man, that is good, that is good, that is good, good, good. Mm-hmm. And your heart flutters with his compassion. You want your heart to flutter? Hmm? You want your heart to flutter? Enjoy that deepening relationship with the Holy Spirit, and your heart will flutter with his compassion. So that one's just not showing compassion to people. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to do that. Have a deepening relationship with the Holy Spirit, and then that mercy will be a great overflow of what he wants. So we should all show mercy to others. I want to sh- challenge you to do some random acts of mercy this week. Um, some, sometime soon, I, I would like you to do a, a, a doorbell ditch. You ever done one of those? So that's when you, you, you get some gifts, you get some... some you meet the needs of others that, that you find out a need and you go to that person's house and you leave gifts and other treats at this person's doorstep. And then Karis has done it to us before. And you, you go and you, you put it on the doorstep, you ring the doorbell, and then you run. And it's great. You just ditch the stuff and you just run. And um, if, you can't, if you can, get a good vantage point from the bushes or something and look and see what they do when they come out and discover it, you know. Don't do that. Don't do that. On second thought, don't do that. You don't understand, officer. My pastor told me to hide in the bushes and stalk the person that lives there. Um, okay, don't do that. Um, but that's a good way to meet somebody's need when they're too embarrassed to ask for it, and you know the need is there, and you don't want to be the one to like, okay, well, here, it's just awkward. So sometimes it's just better just to go leave it and run. That's what Jesus would do. Um, no, Jesus wouldn't do that, but we're able to do that. Okay, so doorbell ditch, you got to do that sometime. Um, compliment everybody today. Have a day where you compliment everybody. Um, pay the toll for the person behind you. Um, I know with tags and stuff, it's not as popular now, but sometimes you can, you can actually pay for the person that's coming up behind you in a toll. If you're in that lane where you're paying cash and you can pay for the person behind you. We did that one time on vacation, and I was just asking the kids, like, okay, so let's just hear from the Holy Spirit. And one of the kids said, Dad, I feel like we're supposed to pay the toll for the person. I'm like, okay, so we pay the toll for the person. They come up beside us, and we're driving down there, and they're like, yes, thank you. <laughs> they rush ahead of us and go ahead of us at the next toll, and they pay ours, which was more expensive. So... <laughs> And that's why we didn't know. Um, but ask the Lord. That's the thing. Ask the Holy Spirit what he have you to do to show mercy and, and grace to people. Um, pay the drive through tab for the person behind you. That's fun. Um, pay at the pump. We did this one time. Uh, same vacation, actually. We, we stopped at the gas station. I'm filling up. And the kids said, I think we should buy that lady gas. I was like, yeah. And the Lord said, that's right. Fill, fill up her tank. Fill, fill it up. I was like, how much fuel efficiency does that have, like? Is it going to be expensive? Or, like, how much does it cost? Like, fill, should I just give $10? Like, just fill up the tank. It was, like, $13 or something like that. But they said, you know, I, I can't believe you did that. I, we were on our honeymoon, and we just, we're, we just wanted, it was such a blessing. It's just, like, people still care. And it was just, like, it was the Lord, because the Lord prompted us to do it. Um, pay for a meal at a restaurant for somebody across the restaurant. Um, ask to pray for your server. This is a great one. Um, they need encouragement, and, and it's, we've seen so many miraculous stories happen from this. Just asking our server, hey, we're Christians. We'd love to pray for you. Is there anything you have to pray for? 
know, they break down. Sometimes they sit next to you and like, you know, unload all these burdens. It's like, yeah, we'll pray for you. And then don't jip them on the tip. All right. If you pray for somebody, give a little, a really good tip. All right. Because nothing, nothing hurts the testimony more than, God bless you. It was great to minister to you. Here's a dollar. It's just not, <laughs> it's, it's not going to work. So um, go on a mission trip. You know, be a friend to that bullied kid, the kid that, that nobody else talks to. Go talk to them. Sit with them at lunch. Befriend them. Help an old lady across the street. Just make sure that the old lady wants to go across the street. Yeah, nothing's worse than, I'm glad you're safely across the street, ma'am. You have a great day. It's like, I actually wanted to stay on that side of the street. Thank you. So you got to walk her back. So just make sure she wants to do that. In all these things, ask the Holy Spirit what he'd have you to do because nothing is worse than trying to show mercy and it's the wrong time and it's the wrong thing and you're just doing it because it's a fun thing to do. Do it because the Holy Spirit calls you to do it and then the reward will be there and the anointing to do it will be there. So don't just pick things and say, I'm going to do this today. In your daily walk, when you see these needs and the Lord says, okay, do this, then do it. Just obey. Just listen to the Holy Spirit for it. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So Not only does Jesus show mercy, we should all show mercy to others. Number three, some of you have mercy, okay? You have mercy as a gift. You don't just show mercy, you actually have mercy, and that's the spiritual gift of mercy. Some of you have mercy. So in the words of Uncle Jesse from Full House, have mercy. I have mercy. 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 As to which I must say, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. All right, so if you don't get the point yet it's have mercy okay so some of you have mercy in other words it's already within you as a gift you have mercy now this is the gift of mercy so in the gift of mercy it's actually in the greek the greek word is an active verb so remember before showing compassion and mercy that was a noun right showing compassion that is the compassion you show is mercy in this context of the spiritual gift of mercy it's an active verb, which means it's a verb with an I-N-G. So when you're doing this, you're actually mercying. You're mercying. So it's a part of what you're doing. It's who you are. You're mercying. You're not just showing mercy. Hey, here's some mercy. You're mercying. Mercy is coming from you. That's a spiritual gift of mercy. So defined, it says the willingness, desire, and conviction to show kindness toward the miserable and afflicted as you are actively seeking through prayer, presence, and action to help them. So in the gift of mercy, you don't just have, oh, I feel sorry for that person. See ya. No, you feel sorry for that person. You see that, and you have empathy for that person, and you want to see it through. You want to take the steps necessary through your presence, through your prayer, to help meet that need. It's not just something that you see. It's something you want to meet. It's a desire and a conviction. I need to respond to this. Um, a great example of this is from Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. Remember the dude gets mugged, and he's all beaten up and things, and he's laying there, and some people come by, and they're like, oh, look at that. Man, stinks to be him. So they just keep walking. Another person comes up and says, oh, I got stuff to do. I gotta, I'm very busy. I got to go. So they leave. And then finally the Samaritan comes along, and that's the story of Luke uh, 10, 33. It says, finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion for him. Now, keep in mind, a Samaritan was the enemy of the Jewish people. They were, they were sworn enemies. So he has compassion for somebody who is an enemy to him, somebody he's not supposed to like. He likes him. He helps him. Finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon a bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion for him. He stooped down, gave him first aid, pouring olive oil on his wounds, disinfecting them with wine, and bandaging them to stop the bleeding. Lifting him up, he placed him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn. Then he carried him to a room for the night. Next morning, he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper with these words, Take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, I will repay you when I return. 
So a mercy person is not just willing just to see the need, but they're willing to meet it and to give them their own time, their own finances, their own self to go and meet that need. They not only see it, they want to see it through. And so that's what a mercy person does, a person with a mercy gift. And so, I mean, look at all that he did. He was moved with tender compassion on him. He bandaged him. He put him on his own donkey. He rode him to the inn. He picked him up and carried him to the room, and then he paid for the room. This is a mercy person in action. It's amazing. So you might be asking yourself, am I a mercy person? Maybe some of the things I've talked about with Good Samaritan, you're like, that's me. That's totally me. So I want to give you some indicators. You might be a mercy person if. You might have mercy if. So I just want to read some of these, and then it'll be an indicator of, okay, is that me? What we're trying to do with this series is to identify, okay, are these things that, is that me? Is this the lens that I see through? So as I read them, ask the Lord that. What, is this the lens? Is this my lens? Is it mercy? So, number one, you sense and reflect the spiritual and emotional atmosphere around you. So that's your lens. That's how you see the world. You sense, you sense that there's something in the atmosphere, and you can, you can kind of feel that. So you, you come into a room, and you automatically know, okay, something's wrong here. Something's off. And a prophecy person might go, okay, i got to speak into this atmosphere and change it. The teacher might be, okay, I need to teach these people how to respond to this. A mercy person is going to be like, they're going to feel it. They're going to know, oh, something's, oh, I feel, it's, a, it's in my feelings. I feel something's off here. A mercy person, you'll see them sometimes like at the mall or in a public place. There'll be somebody over in the corner. They're struggling. They're, they're crying, and they're just upset. And you'll see somebody come up and put their hand on them and ask them, hey, what's going on? Can I, can I talk to you? That's a mercy person. It's a person that cannot ignore somebody that's in need. That scares some people. They see the person crying over there like, I ain't getting into their business. That's their own baggage going on right there. I don't know. I don't want to be part of that. The mercy person can't help it. They have to go. So they sense the atmosphere. You respond to an emotional and spiritual need of others. You respond. It's not just that you sense something's going on. You actually respond to it. You are motivated by your feelings. In other words, you're sensitive, and your feelings... You can, you're kind of in touch with your feelings, so you can hear that. And your heart must take action. It's your heart. Your heart is moved. Your, your feelings, you're, you're feeling that this person is in need and, you, and that you respond. Um, I went to a, a Haiti mission trip meeting um, with some missionaries that are coming from South Brandon over to Haiti in June. We we're excited about it. And um, so I'm looking around at all these people, and they ask, why are you going to Haiti? And each person goes, because of the children, or because of the people, or because this nation needs the Lord so bad. We all went, and it was a mercy fest. I mean, it was every one of those missionaries was like, Aah. we're like crying and bawling, and we haven't been on the mission trip yet. We ha- we're even thinking about the possibility of going on the mission trip, and our heart is moved with compassion. We're all, blah, 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 blah. and it's, it's a wonderful thing, because mercy was going on. And that was the reason why. They can't not go to Haiti. It's like, why are you going to hate? I can't not go. God said, this is the time to go. I can't not go. I got to go. I need to go there. That's the feeling. That's the emotion that happens for a mercy person. So you're motivated by feelings. You love to pray because it releases your emotions and captures God's heart. So mercy people give the most prayer request of anybody. <laughs> We're in a prayer meeting and the mercy people, they're like, and my Aunt Susie, and my coworker, and, and they're always adding people to the prayer list because they want to see change in that person's life. And prayer makes them feel better. They have a burden for this person. They go to the Lord and say, God, you have to meet this need. Use me how you want to use me, but I just have this burden. That releases their emotions and it taps into God's heart and they can say, okay, God's got this. He knows the need. It makes me feel better. So prayer, you love prayer. And you are able to enter into the grief or happiness of others. You're able to show empathy. So sympathy feels for others, but empathy feels with others. You don't just feel for them. You feel along with them. And you actually, a lot of times, have those same emotions that they're going through. So if they're crying, you're going to go cry with them. If they're laughing, you're going to go laugh with them. Um, and when there's a death in the family, you are the first to be at the house holding someone's hand or fixing a meal for them. When there's a promotion on the job, you jump up and down with the person. You feel that what they feel. And then you love the people that others tend to run away from. So if you're a mercy person, you love the people that everybody else don't want to be around. Okay, So you are drawn to those people, 
And, it, and a lot of times you'll see that. The compassionate mercy people will be the ones sitting with that kid at lunch that nobody else sits with. They're, they're drawn to those people. So needy people, you're drawn to them. At the outcast, the handicapped, the elderly, the seriously ill, the wounded, the rebellious. And some other people are scared of those people. But you run to them. You're drawn to them. And you can't not minister to them. You reflect the heart of God towards needy people. And so you feel what God feels for that person. That's mercy. You are humble because you know your own failures. You're humble if you're a mercy person. So even now, if you're the person saying, I wouldn't say I'm humble. If you said that, you're probably a mercy person. Because you're not saying you're humble right now, even though I just told you you're humble. I'm like, I don't I don't like when people call me humble. I just, yeah, you're humble, okay? So you're a mercy person. You're feeling in that way. So here's a great quote. It says, if you're a mercy shower, you have the spirit-given capacity, spirit-given capacity, and desire to serve God by identifying with and comforting those who are in distress. You are the person who understands and comforts fellow Christians. So if you feel like you have that, it's a supernatural ability. You can't help yourself. It's who you are naturally. You show God's compassion to other people. You're probably a mercy person. Now, a mercy person does have weaknesses. Each of these, one, each of these gifts have, have weaknesses. Times they get in the extreme. All right, so each of these gifts kind of have areas of weakness. So we want to identify one of those just as poor Mr. Bean was trying to minister, but just the wrong timing. So, so first of all, some of the weaknesses of a mercy person. Mercy, mercy people can be indecisive, tossed to and fro by their emotions. So as a daddy of little girls, I can tell you this one is a weakness for mercy people because, I don't know, for some reason I didn't show mercy for the boys. I don't know when you guys. But um, the girls, I don't know. They just come to me and they're like, and they're like, their eyes penetrate your very soul. And it's like, you want to help him or have mercy on him. My wife's like, don't do that. Do not give that to them. I'm like, but they don't want it. I'm not, not right now. So maybe you're, you're tossed to and fro by your emotions if you're a mercy person. And you're just like, but your emotions will drive you. And it's like, okay. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a, it's a weakness. So be careful where your emotions take you. Um, so also, mercy people tend to avoid conflict. Who likes conflict? I don't really like it. Um, at times, you avoid needed confrontation. So sometimes there are confrontations that need to happen, and you're a mercy person, and you don't want to have that confrontation. And to avoid conflict at all costs, you just avoid it. You hope it gets better. You ever been there? You don't want to offend the person by going to them and, and confronting them. So sometimes that needed confrontation is there. You avoid confrontation um the same jehovah's witnesses that came to pastor's house this week came to my house and i didn't i didn't tell him about the resurrection or anything <laughs> you know pastor did that it was good it was good so see he was going to use you to do that he d- i didn't need to do that so when they come and the little girl has a little pamphlet you know it's like oh the little girl giving me the pamphlet i don't think about like this is not truth or anything like that i just think like oh and it's like, man, you got to admire their efforts because, you know, they're hot and sweaty. It's hot outside. They're walking around, you know. They're doing it for God. I mean, they think they, you know, like they, they're, 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 you have mercy on them. It's like, oh, you guys are great to get out here and do this. <laughs> oh, no. It's like, have a great day. Bye. You know. Then he went to pastor's house. Pastor, put them straight. That's good. <laughs> Using his gifts, I'm using my gifts. It's all good. It's all good. Um, where was I? I was somewhere in the message. Okay, um, like for mercy, like sometimes confrontation is needed. And my wife gives me a hard time for this one because I will never send food back. I do not care if it is a raw piece of meat sitting on my plate and it needs to be cooked more. Somebody else is going to have to tell the server, and I don't ever want them to. Just don't. I'll eat it. I'll eat it. It's fine. I don't want to. I don't want to upset the server. I want to make them go back to the kitchen. Like, that's more work for them. Like, why do you <laughs> want to do that? I might offend the cook. If I send it back, he's going to be like, oh, man, I failed. Like, I can't have him. That. I can't have that. I'll eat it, whatever. <laughs> you know, If I get my order, if they get my order wrong or something through the drive-thru, my wife's like, go back in. Just go back around. Drive around. And get it. I was like, nah, I'll eat it. 
I was like, you didn't want a fish sandwich. She's like, it's fine. Fish sandwich rather than a burger is probably better anyway. You know, I just, I don't want to, to have the conflict. I want to show mercy to the people. People are like, you guys are like, man, he's crazy. Um, but the thing is, sometimes as a mercy person, people are crossing your boundaries left and right, and you're not doing anything about it. And the Lord wants you to say, okay, you're crossing the boundaries. You need to stop there or whatever. But maybe you just want to show mercy. That's all you want to do. But sometimes you need to confront. Um, mercy people often become rescuers of those who should not be rescued. That's the biggest one. We often become rescuers to those who shouldn't be rescued. So God's doing something in their life. He's teaching them something, and we come into the rescue, and we fix that need. We help meet that need when the Lord wants them to have that need for a while. He wants to teach them that. But we as a mercy person think that we have to respond every time to every situation. We need to come in and be God, the rescuer. Yes, he'll use you a lot of times to do that, but it's got to be the right time. It's got to be God's timing. And also, sometimes we want rescue more than those who need to be rescued want for themselves. So as a mercy person, like, you want freedom so bad for that person. You want them to walk in the abundant life so bad that you actually want that rescue more for them than they want. And they're not willing to go through the change that's needed. So us, us mercy people, we have that. So how we can remedy that is we can ask the Lord. Here's the whole thing. If we're led by the Holy Spirit and this whole mercy thing is an overflowing of what's already there and we have mercy as a gift, then God's going to use that naturally in our lives. We don't have to create it. We don't have to respond every time. All we have to do is listen to the Holy Spirit. And if we sense we're supposed to do something, then we do something. If we feel like, no, it's not the right time or it doesn't feel right, you know, and those things, trust your feeling. If, it's, uh, if something's wrong, it's like, nah, I feel like I should, but it's not the right time. Just obey what the Holy Spirit says and ask him. Ask him, am I the one to do this? And is this the right time? So if you're a mercy person, ask him, am I, am I supposed to respond here? Or is this the right time? Maybe you want me to wait. Maybe you don't want me to respond right now. Um, am I the one to do this? I asked this to the Lord the other day. I pulled up. I was at Publix, and I, I came out, and there was a guy that had popped his hood, and he was looking under the car, and he was trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm, like, in my heart, I'm like, oh. I want to go help that guy. And I feel like the Holy Spirit says, he's like, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, really, you going to write a song about repairing a vehicle? What are you going to do for this guy? Can you help him at all? Can you, do you even know, if you uh, looked under the hood, would you know anything? Would you know the positive negation and whatever? I don't know anything about it. So am I the one? Like, no, I'm not, <laughs> I am not the one to do that. Somebody else, God is gonna, needs to move upon a mercy person who knows how to fix a car, to go minister to that person. If I step in, I'm just going to be in the way. So ask the Lord, am I the one to do this? And most of the time, it's going to be something you can actually do. <laughs> so be, be aware of that. Okay, and then the next one, is this the right time? It might not be the right time. The other day, I'm driving down the road. I drive a lot. I'm driving down the road. I look over, and, and there was this house, and the, the porch was kind of one of those lean-to porches, and, and the eave of the porch was on fire. It was like smoking. It was like little little embers of, of flame there on the top of it. And I'm like, oh, I need to go help. <laughs> and I heard that voice again, like, what are you going to do? You're going to go park in front of the fire hydrant, and then you're going to trip over a hose, and you have to have medical attention taken away, and they're going to come up and give you medical attention because you're stepping in. You don't have, you. it's great. Pray for them. And I'm like, all right, I'll pray for them. Good. So that was my part. I was supposed to pray for them. I wasn't supposed to be running in there, being the rescuer at that time. Okay, so you have to ask the Lord, am I the one to do this, and is this the right timing? There's a quote here. It says, without a biblical foundation, caregiving often doesn't work, leaving caregivers under heavy burdens and frustration because of their failure to help people. So I'll say this. I'll kind of reword it. Without the leadership of the Holy Spirit, caregiving often doesn't work, leaving caregivers under heavy burdens and frustration because of their failure to help people. So a lot of times, us mercy people will take on the burden of another person that's not ours to take on. We are supposed to have compassion and show them compassion and walk in mercy, but we're not supposed to be their rescuer. We're not supposed to be their savior. That's Jesus. We're not supposed to be their Holy Spirit. Yes, God will use us in those situations, but it's not all on, all on us. So if you're feeling that burden of a mercy person and you're just like, oh, it torments you, 
That's not what the Lord wants. That's the enemy trying to put that burden on you. It's not yours. So as I've been talking today, maybe you, you've heard some of these and say, that's definitely not me. I don't have any of those characteristics. That's fine. You have other gifts, and that's cool. And we can still show compassion to people. But some of you have mercy. So when we, I talked about that, you're like, that's me. Every time I feel the need to respond, I have to. My heart has to do it. I have to respond. So let's just pray. I just want to ask that you just bow your heads and, and ask the Lord, is that me? Is this the lens that I see through? Is, it, is, is mercy the lens that I see through? Is this how, how I see the world? Was that me? And just ask yourself, and the Holy Spirit is going to lead you in that. So we began this message series asking the question, what are you great at? What are you great at? So you were born for greatness. Al was born for greatness. Sal was born for greatness. You, you weren't born for mediocrity. You weren't born for a life of boredom and just getting by and just paying the bills. You, your destiny is greatness, and you know what? You know that. You know that right here because the Holy Spirit lives in you, and He is great, and He wants greatness to get out of you, and you need to find what that greatness is, and your gift will point to your calling. So for the past several weeks, it's been our desire to help you to find greatness within you. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, So let your light shine before others, that they will see your good works, they will see your greatness, and then... Give glory to your heavenly Father. The Apostle Paul saying to his protege, Timothy, fan the flame. You think about a flame, a fire. Fan the flame of the spiritual gifts that God gave you through the laying on of my hands as I prayed for you. So we're asking God to fan the flames of your spiritual gift because that's how others are going to see God through you. Not through trying hard or not through religious acts, but through the spiritual gifts that God's given you coming out of you as you minister within the church, without, outside of the church. So in Romans chapter 12, verse 6, the Bible says that God has given to us spiritual gifts enabling us to do things well. There are things that God wants you to do well. And when people see you in your, I call it the joy zone, that, that sweet spot. When you're in that joy zone, in that sweet spot, and it's, it's just coming through you, that's when others see God in you. So I want you to stand with me. So this is the last message. Next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, and I'm going to be preaching on the transformation that comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm so excited about it. I could start right now just preaching to you, just practice on you. So, you know, we've asked you to pray, you know, to make sure that you invite someone to come. After Easter, we're going to begin our new message series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. Discernment of spirits, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, miraculous powers, faith, healing, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. We're going to begin after Easter. Sharing what it looks like for the Holy Spirit's gifts. So these are the Holy Spirit's gifts. The ones in 1 Corinthians 12. So these ones in Romans 12, so they're your gifts. They're, they, they reside within you. It's how God has made you. It's the, it's the vision he has given you to see needs. So you're going to see things that other people aren't going to see. You're going to see needs, and you're going to be motivated to meet those needs. That's why they're called the motivational gifts. 
So those of you who have the gift of mercy, you're going to see people in need, and it's going to give you the desire, motivate you to help out and to reach out. Some of us, we need to do it because we're like Jesus, and it's the compassion of Jesus, but it doesn't motivate us. So those of you, and as Pastor Chris was speaking, you know mercy is a part of who you are. It's how you see the world. It's your view, Master. I want you to come and stand with me right here to the right, those of you who have the mercy gift, because we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to activate that or to fan it into flame, as the Apostle Paul said. So those of you with the mercy gift, I want you to come to my right. And those of you who have not been prayed for yet, for one of the seven spiritual gifts, I began this message series telling you what it would look like if you were in the hospital. And if one of these spiritual gifts came to see you, to give you a picture of what it would look like. So I want to conclude this message series giving you a picture of what it would look like if you were stuck in an ele elevator. It just stopped between floors. The prophecy person is going to want to hear from God. So they're going to be like, okay, let's get quiet. Obviously, God has us in a place where he wants to speak to us. And they may even give you a word from God. So the prophecy person is always trying to bring heaven to earth, the voice of God to the earth, to speak into a situation. The teacher, now you know your teacher if you always have the answer, right, Matthew? Matthew's my son. Matthew always had the answer. Matthew is a teacher. You know your teacher if you always have the answer. If, if you're motivated, not just, not just that it works, but you want to know why it works. So the teacher, if you're stuck with the teacher in an elevator that's not working, they're going to open that door up and get the manual out. And they're going to figure out how to make this thing work. That's your teacher. Your encourager is going to say, listen, this is just temporary. These doors will open again. But God's trying to do something in your life. He's trying to move you and shape you into the image of Christ. So they're going to encourage you through those tribulations, through those trials. The leader, he's the organizer. He's the administrator. He's going to say, okay, let's figure out how to get out of this place. And right away, the person who has the service gifts, the servers, they're going to say, well, hey, I'll get on my full fours and let somebody stand on my back so they can, you know, the servers just jump to, to volunteer to help right away. I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer. I'll help. Listen, leaders, we love helpers. We love serve. Can't, can't give enough servants to come help me, you know. We love, because we want to tell you what to do. All right, we who are leaders, you know. Uh, so we love you servants. Yes, keep volunteering. And then uh, you have your mercy people. Pastor Chris has been, the, the mercy people in this in this elevator that's not moving, they're, they're going to look for children, make sure they're okay. They're going to look for people who could be distressed, who, 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 have, who have claustrophobia, whatever, and they're going to want to comfort. So your mercy people, they're going to be comforting everybody. And then those with the gift of giving, they're going to take an offering. They're going to say, you know, we need to take an offering for this. This, 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 this never happens again. We don't want this elevator ever to stop again. We need to take an offering right now, make sure that this doesn't happen again. So, so those are motivational gifts or giving. You want to solve physical problems, and you want to make sure that there's, there's answers there. And so give to it or make sure that others give to it. So this is, is the body of Christ together. And Jesus, he was all seven of these things. Because we, the church, we are now the body of Christ. We are Jesus on this earth. And it takes all of us to do this together. So if you've not been prayed for yet, I want you to come to my left. Because we want to ask the Lord to activate that gift in your life. So if, you have, if you're not even sure what it is yet, we want you to come forward. And we want you to be to my left right now. Because we want to pray for you. So any of the other gifts... Maybe you just got it. Maybe as I just went through the elevator illustration, you got it. Yes, that's what I am. Then we want you to come. And we want, elevator, uh, we want the elders, if you would come, just begin to pray uh, for these who are in the front. Because we know, that as Paul said to Timothy, to stir up the gift, to fan the flame of those spiritual gifts that were given to you through the laying on of hands of the Holy Spirit. I don't understand this, okay? But something happens 
when people whom God has given authority, spiritual authority, when they lay their hands on you, something is released in your life. Sometimes things are planted in your life, seeds. And so those of you who are fathers and mothers, you need to be praying over your children continuously, placing your hands on them and saying, Father, I call forth the call of God in my child's life. Their anointing and their blessing that it will be released. So you need to be putting your hands on your kids in a good way. All right, Miles, in a good way. And praying over them. And so those that God has called us to be leaders, those office gifts in particular, the apostles, uh, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, the Bible says they are to equip, they are to empower the church to do the work of the ministry. That's our role. So God has given us that authority to lay hands on you and to empower you to be what God has called you to be. So, so as this is the last message of this message series. If you've not been prayed for, for God to activate and release one of those seven gifts, then I want you to come and stand here to my left as our leaders will come and pray for you. So just take a few moments, just close your eyes, because we don't want anybody to miss this opportunity for your gift to be activated by the Holy Spirit. It was, it's always there within you. But God wants it to be activated. He wants it to be released. Because there are needs out there that God wants you to meet. And He's given you a perspective to see those needs. back from my Sabbath, and, and I so th am so thankful for that opportunity just to be able to rest and come back refreshed, and, and Pastor Chris began to share with me what God was doing in his life, and I just placed my hands on him. I came into agreement, and since then, it's just been even greater anointing and greater activation. I'm sure you've seen him, Pastor Chris. He's changed. He's different. He sees the congregation different. So, so these gifts can be in you, and they need to be, they need to be activated. They need to be released in you. And God does that through through us. Just like when Jesus walked this earth and he prayed and he laid hands on people and things were released, things were activated. So God's called us now to be the hands of Jesus to, to pray over people. So don't miss this opportunity to come forward and to be prayed over. For God to release his anointing in your life. Because that's where the joy comes from. The joy comes when you serve the king and you make a difference in this world. Amen to that. So as they continue to be prayed for, next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. It is truly the celebration of the greatest day in human history. People are more open to come to church on Easter than any other time. So make sure you're bold this week. Invite people to come. Jesus, he truly is the way, the truth, and the life. So God bless you. Thank you for coming to South Brandon Worship Center. We are the family church. And let's take a few moments just to greet, greet one another. If you see somebody you don't know, tell them how glad you are that they came today. God bless you.